John Noe unveils Greater Than We Believe with your host, Stephen King. Welcome back. This is Stephen King and my friend John Noe. We are coming back to you again for the continuing series of Greater Than We Believe. We thank you so much for attending and for tuning in. And uh, we ask that you um, will, uh, if you're coming in late on the series, if you haven't uh, been here since the beginning, we've got a, almost a hundred of these videos posted. Uh, you might want to go back and see what you missed because you'll see a lot of uh, quality uh, videos put out there. This uh, is video 100. This is video 100. Woohoo! I'm going to that. Yay! Thank you, Milestone. Jesus. That means that uh, in two more weeks, it'll be 100, no, four more weeks, it'll be 104, which will be 252 weeks. So it'll be exactly two years in four more weeks. So, well, I'm, I'm hoping that a lot of you have been around all this time. And for those of you who haven't, there's a lot you can catch up on. There's a, there's a lot of really good stuff from four. Right now, we are promoting the sub-series uh, subheading called King, The Kingdom Driven Church, and um, the title today of today's video is An Amazing Story. We are using Pastor Sunday's books as uh, a reference here, and we are taking the idea of the kingdom, which we've been talking about through Kingdom Christianity, that was a, more of a theological standpoint. Now we're taking a practical, humanist, I mean not humanistic, but a more of a day-to-day -day approach to to the kingdom of you and I and how we live the kingdom and, and a pastoral, and a pastoral, sure, yeah, yeah. yeah. So this is this is putting it into a, a usable format for you and I. And John, if you would just go ahead and take this uh, amazing story, to amaze us with it. <laughs> <laughs> amazing story. Yeah, I'm reminded of third grade. Okay, and because I act so silly. And one of the things that I enjoyed. <laughs> And, and remember back fondly mm -hmm. from third, fourth, and so forth, is is when the teacher would say, "Okay, I'm going to read you a story." Yay! You know what? Yeah, yeah that's why because yeah. we like that because yeah. we didn't have to do anything except to sit there and listen. Right. And we could just sit there and listen. Now we weren't able to interact. Right. But but that's what I'm going to do. I mean, I I've never done that okay. in, in any of these videos. So this video is going to be totally different. Yeah. Because I'm going to read you an amazing story. Now, we'll interact sure. and, and do, do that kind of stuff. And I may make a few comments here and there. I may not, but I probably will. Sure. <laughs> and you probably will, too. Sure. So this is the amazing story of Pastor Sunday at Elijah. Okay. And I'm going to shift to his book, Church Shift. Okay. To, to pull some of this from. Now, I'm not reading the whole thing. Oh, no. I'm just reading you tidbits sure. out of this or... or or portions of it. This is about a Nigerian, black Nigerian, mm -hmm. with who who was raised in hum, the humble beginnings, without a father mm. or a mother. Mm. Here's how it goes. Unlike most people reading this book, I grew up with no possessions and little opportunity. You got some? Mm. And, and of course, I've already re revealed to you what, well, sure. how God has used this guy. Absolutely. I never had real parents. I was born to a mother who chose not to raise me. Hmm. Do you know any mothers today that are choosing not to raise their babies in the womb? Millions. And a father I never knew. He was run out of our village before I was even born because people said he was too violent. I never even knew his name. Wow. I grew up among 40 small huts in the Nigerian village of, got this long name, I won't even think of it now. <laughs> my grandmother raised me. I grew up believing she was my mother. Hmm. My biological mother visited occasionally. Oh, well, that's good. With her new husband and her new children. But I thought she was my aunt. Hmm. 
I took the last name of my mother's family, Adelijah. The Adelijahs were a family of kings. My grandfather had been the king of our village, 40 huts. <laughs> Remember, 40 huts. Yeah. <laughs> okay. And two of my older uncles and one aunt served in the powerful positions in Nigeria. While I was growing up, my two uncles and aunt gave our family financial stability and enhanced our reputation among the people. But we were not rich, but our basic needs were met. And my cousins had enough money to attend school. I and my cousins had enough money to attend school. But when I was six years old, a great tragedy befell. Those three family pillars died mysteriously within six months of each other. Mm -hmm. The coincidence was so strange that a major newspaper ran a front story asking, "What it uh, was it a tragedy or a curse? Many people believe witchcraft mm -hmm. played a role in their deaths. The effect on my family was devastating. Our reputation and our finances plummeted. We were left without leaders. My grandmother, whom I believe was my mother, could hardly cope with the shock of losing three of her children. She went into a coma for an entire year. Mm. I was six years old, and I had no way to survive. I had no food. I was the only member of my family left in the village. Again, 40 huts. Mm. Mud huts. Mud pathways and so forth. And my grandmother, who was now incapacitated with, group, with grief, I had no choice but to start working to support myself. Six years old. <coughs> I went into the bush, cut down trees with an axe, tied to the, uh, and tied the wood into bundles, and took it on my head to the nearest city to sell for firewood. I used money to buy food and pay my school bills so I could keep learning. Isn't that something? He kept going to school, wow. and you had to pay to pay to go there. Mm. You know, to supplies and all that kind of stuff. When my grandmother got well, she joined me in chopping and selling firewood. She also taught me to make cereal from corn pulp. It was like breakfast custard. I had three jobs when I was just eight years old: harvesting firewood, making custard, and going house to house saying, "Who wants to buy custard? Who wants to buy firewood?" But I kept attending school hmm. at St. Paul's Ange uh, Angelic Angelical Angelican Primary School, knowing somehow that education would provide a better future for me. I had to walk several kilometers barefoot to the city to sell my products, and several kilometers more to school in a nearby village. As I grew into adolescence, I became ashamed and self-conscious of my jobs. It was humiliating to walk the streets hawking wood and custard, but I had to. There was no other way. Then an even worse thing happened. When I was 15, my grandmother died, and I was left virtually all alone. I had to fend for myself, so I rented f uh, some farmland and began uh, farming cassava, a kind of yam. I needed additional income to finish high school. I needed to buy uniforms and pencils and other supplies, and the money I made selling firewood and custard was not enough. So I cleared and cultivated the land and grew, and grew cavasa. People in the village would point me out to their children and say, he's all alone. Mm. But he is making a living for himself. I was a good example to them, but I was angry about my life. I thought there was no God or that he was wicked. I had older uncles whom I considered brothers. One had gotten a scholarship and gone to Moscow to study. He urged me to do the same. He wrote me a letter and said that the only hope you have in Nigeria is to get a scholarship and get the hell out. Mm. But how do you do that? I added that. <laughs> if you don't finish high school, he wrote, you will live forever in that village of four small huts. Forty. Forty. 
40. Scholarship. I'm glad you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> Scholarships were few, and thousands of people applied. But I took his advice and redoubled my efforts to do well in school. I mean, how, how many would respond to, the, to his situations that he, and, and, and want to do well in school? Hmm. To better himself. Really? Is that God-given? Absolutely. I was getting some financial help from another aunt, whom I considered my sister. She had boyfriends. <laughs> you know what that means. That gave her access to money. Uh, and, she, and she shared with her brothers and with me. But when I was 18, she came by one day and said she couldn't send me support money anymore. Why? I got saved, she said, and now I can't have boyfriends anymore. <laughs> you know you know what kind of impression that's got to give somebody about Christianity? Absolutely. I mean, why wouldn't you tuck your tail and say, I don't want anything to do with that? Yeah. Uh, she told me, I felt like my world had come to an end. I had no concept of being saved or living right. I was living as an unbeliever. I went to church, but also to discos. Uh, now my one extra source of money was cut off. I managed to finish high school, however. I was not the top student, but I was good enough to have a shot at a scholarship. At age 18, I left my village to work in a polyester factory in a bigger village where I lived with an older relative and applied for a university scholarship. There was a lag time between when I applied and when I would find out if I received the scholarship. I worked all day in the factory, and I liked to come home and relax by watching news on television. One day, a religious program came on after the news. The preacher caught my attention because he was a dean of mathematics at a Nigerian university. For the first time, I considered the gospel message. I became convinced it was true. I wanted God's forgiveness, so I went into my room and repented of my sins. It felt like 200 kilometers or kilograms of weight dropped from my shoulders, I went to the street immediately and felt like greeting everyone. I was determined to go to the end of the world and tell people that God is real. I began to work even harder after giving my life to Jesus. Instead of just working my way out of poverty, I was now working for an eternal kingdom. Hallelujah. I could not believe the riches I had found. The gospel completely changed my mind and renewed my efforts. I became serious, ambitious, and determined to succeed in life. I stopped spending my time partying or running after girls. Soon the result of my application came. I had passed my school exams and won a scholarship to study uh, journalism in the Soviet Union. Mm. Good news and bad news, mm. as you will see here in a minute. Six months after I had met the Lord, I left the shores of Nigeria and headed to the heart of the communist empire. I was so new in Christ that I had never even belonged to a church. Mm. Isn't that something? Well. So he talks about, and then he, then he talks about the blessings of work, and I'm going to skip over that. And uh, hard work and so forth, I'm going to skip over that. And I'm going to go right to Russia. You still with me? Yep. All right. The scholarship I had received for a university education, how are we doing on time? Good. Uh, sent me to the Soviet Union. This was not my first choice. I wanted to go to the United States or to Britain, uh, our United Kingdom, as an, uh, uh, because these were uh, great modern places. I wanted to see those worlds for myself, but the application abroad, uh, uh, but I was sent to Russia. That country wanted to train people in developing countries like Nigeria. Why? So that they could return to their countries and lead a communist revolution. I was a little wary of going there, but I sensed God had a purpose in it. Before I went to Russia, a pastor in Nigeria told me, it will be difficult, but if you survive it, you will make it anywhere. 
Isn't that something? Yep. Life has but, but ifs. Hmm. But if you but survive if. it. <laughs> I left Nigeria in 1986, not realize What were you doing in 1986? Hmm. Not, uh, I left Nigeria in 1986, not realizing that I was about to get two educations. One at the Russian University, the other in the school of Hard Pers knocks. Persecution. <laughs> oh, persecution. Wow. That's harder than hard yeah, knocks. Yeah, it's harder than hard knocks. Persecution. There I learned that a key to ruling my promised land is to enjoy the school of persecution. Hmm. If you're not enrolled yet, you will be. <laughs> I've been enrolled for years, and I doubt that I will ever graduate. But guess what? <clears throat> he said, I'm glad for persecution. Persecution has kingdom purposes. Hmm. I'll explain why. It says God, because here the next section is, God speaks to you in times of persecution. When I got to Russia, I quickly became frustrated and disappointed. I was expecting Russia to be an economic superpower like America not just a military superpower, but I was shocked at the low standard of living and poor economy there. Worst of all, there was no church on Sundays. There was, in effect, no Sunday. Just a weekend. And there was no place to learn about God. As a new Christian, I felt cut off from the teaching I needed. I cried and prayed, God, why did you allow me to come to this place? Then something supernatural happened to me. That remains unique in my experience, as he explains. I went to bed one night, and while I was asleep, Jesus came to me. Oh, wow. Mm. Sounds like one of the stories we had before. And showed me my future. Mm. I saw myself preaching to a huge audience of white people. <laughs> I was seeing miracles and signs and wonders happen. The next night, the same thing happened. And again on the third night, I saw everything so clearly, he says. I remember the clothes I wore. I was on stage with famous preacher, preachers. Then Jesus came and took the microphone from one of them and gave it to me. The, the preachers stepped back and I came forward and Jesus stood beside me. Miracles began to happen. I was calling out sicknesses. People were getting out of wheelchairs. People were coming to testify. I had never preached before and was only a young convert, six months in the Lord. With those thoughts in my mind, I had opened the Bible and it fell to Jeremiah 1, 7 through 10. Jeremiah 1, 7 through 10 <clears throat> says, But the Lord said to me, Do not say, I am only a child. You must go to everyone I send you to and say whatever I command you. Do not be afraid of them, for I am with you, and I will rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord reached out his hand and touched my mouth and said to me, Now I have put my words in your mouth. See, today I appoint you over nations and kingdoms to uproot and tear down, to destroy and overthrow, to build up and to plant. So in obedience, he says, <laughs> In obedience, he said, I took my pen and wrote down my whole experience. And when it was over, I was mesmerized and perplexed by it. Hmm. From that point on, God's vision went silent. Man, you would think you had something like that. You get this at least every other week. Mm -hmm. You'd have you know a follow-up visit, mm -hmm. right? From that point on, nothing. I never had that kind of encounter again in my life. Mm. I studied in the Soviet Union for six years, he goes on. During that time, the Christians I knew went through many trials. Some were sent to psychiatric wards. Others were dismissed from the universities, and some were deported. Those of us who remained worshiped together in silence. While I was in my room with my roommate, I would pretend to sleep so that I could pray under my blanket. I had morning devotions in the bathroom, and I often was con convinced I too would be found out and deported. 
One time in my first year there, my fellow students heard about my religious interest and warned me to hide my Bible in the bottom of my suitcase and not to take it out until I got back to Nigeria six years later. Mm. God does not exist here, they said. But I didn't hide it. I had even put a picture of Jesus over my bed. <laughs> I don't know why I did that, but it, uh, well, stay tuned. One evening after class, I heard banging on my door. I opened it and saw four men and a woman, our dean and my roommate, a KGB officer and a Communist Party official. They pointed to the portrait of Jesus uh, over my bed and said, what is this? <laughs> and I said, this isn't a what, it's a who. <laughs> well, that's not accommodating to them. Uh, remove it. Or you will be punished, they said. Religious propaganda is punishable by law. You could go to prison under Article 35. <laughs> I understood then that my roommate had been writing a secret dossier on me, and I had been betrayed. I was frustrated and angry, but I heard God say in that moment, this is only a picture. Hmm. Remove it from the wall, but don't allow them to remove him from your heart. Hmm. So I removed it from the wall, but I continued to grow in the knowledge of Christ during my time in Belarus, which was in Soviet Union. God trained me during the persecution. He taught me to rely on him. He taught me to be wise in how I conducted myself. And then he goes on, he, he summarizes, in persecution you learn new skills, and he has these insights. He says, some people want to be released from hardship before they have acquired the skills God wants them to have. In my case, God knew he wanted me to minister in the Ukraine. So I needed to learn the Russian language and the Russian culture. If I hadn't come to Russia and stuck it out through the tough times, I never would have learned Russian and would not have fulfilled the destiny God had for me in Ukraine. Hmm. Even though I was hiding out as a Christian and occasionally suffering hardship because of it, I used the time to gain new skills and knowledge. And when I came to Russia, I didn't know a word of the language. Hmm. Isn't that something? You go to Russia to go to school, to scholarship, that's college level? Yeah. And you don't even know the language? Listen to this. We were immersed in it for nine months and then started studying together with students who spoke Russian fluently. I remember when I went to college, uh, I had taken Latin in high school, and I decided I'd, I'd branch out since I went to a liberal arts school and I'd be more liberal. Mm -hmm. So I'd take Spanish, and when I walked into the first class, there were guys in there, and, and this is Spanish one, 101, and they're already speaking Spanish to the professor. Wow. I didn't know a word of Spanish. <laughs> It was a rough year. Yeah, I believe that. And I, I quit Spanish after the first year hmm. because it, the second year is going to be even worse, and I knew I couldn't. And I went back to Latin. So I can identify <laughs> with this, I'll tell you, brother. He said, we were immersed in it for nine months and then started studying together. I had taken notes and listened to lectures, read and do, do my homework in Russian. All of it was in Russian. Hmm. College, never spoke the language, and went to college and had to learn a whole new language. Isn't that something? Mm. It was difficult. Well, that's an understatement. But I buried myself in books and learning, and I exercised myself in godliness and became one of the best students. I graduated from the university with honors. Only a few other students had obtained that distinction. Isn't that something? It's amazing. You want to hear the end of the story? Sure. He goes on, and I'll wrap up real quickly here. He says, persecution may be the fastest way to become kingdom-minded. Hmm. <laughs> it's like a pressure cooker and pushes out the old nature. Mm -hmm. Isn't that something? All right. He goes on. Finally, he says, we need to be faithful and let God judge our persecutors. If people don't receive you or the gospel, shake the dust off your shoes and hand them over to God. He says, fear of persecution has limited the church. Mm -hmm. Want to know why we're not out uh, proclaiming the kingdom? And hence, power, and hence the power of God to the four walls of our sanctuaries. We enjoy the comfort of it so much we forget that Jesus left the comfort of heaven. Yes. 
and sacrificed everything to bring his kingdom to us on earth. But today he is asking us to go <laughs> to the world and endure all the world can throw at us. And you got Philippians there, two. Mm -hmm. so the, the earth will become ours if we will only act as Jesus did in, G, in Philippians 2, 7 through 9. Uh, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness, and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. So Sunday, Pastor Sunday, Summarizes, he says, persecution is part of the Christian lifestyle. Expect it. Mm. And rejoice in it as you grow into the stature of a mighty man or woman of God. Mm. Is there anybody who, other than Jesus, who, who, I mean, this guy really lived it. Yes. So, are you experiencing persecution? And if not, why not? Mm hmm. Is it because you are hunkered down in some well-fortified, comfortable position and not outdoing what Pastor Sunday is talking about here? Mm. And church shift and the kingdom-driven life? All right, for the end of the story. Mm -hmm. And we're just about done. Okay. You hanging in there? Yep. When I completed my journalistic studies in Belarus, Communism was just beginning to crumble. And I and other Christians had begun taking the gospel message to the streets more boldly. It was an exciting time of new freedoms, but the old powers had not lost their sting. Because of my religious activities, the government asked me to leave Belarus. Asking means they get deported. I resisted strongly in prayer, but God said to me clearly and distinctly, leave Belarus. And I protested, no, Lord, this is my promised land. I cannot leave. Mm -hmm. I had sown my life there for seven years. Now it appeared that God wanted to send me back to Africa. Mm. Now it appeared, uh, finally, I gave up my fight. I decided that if the Lord wanted to use me in Africa, that was his decision. I was heartbroken, but obedient. Mm. But God didn't want to send me to Africa, after all. Rather, he opened a new door for me to come to Ukraine. I got a call from a television station in Kyiv, Kyiv, what do you pronounce Kiev. Kiev, that needed a journalist who spoke Russian. Ah, how about that? Interesting. My fiance, Boise, a Nigerian student whom I had met in Russia, agreed to join me there. I started my journalism career in Kiev, helping to produce and script shows for this pioneering television station. I was having much early success. Hmm. But after only a year in Kiev, I felt God uh, nudging me to begin a church. Hmm. Then God told me something that set the foundation for my life ever since. He said, quote, Here in Ukraine, I want to raise up strong, large churches with many thousands of members for the purpose of spreading the gospel throughout the whole world. In the same way the Soviet Union planted communism around the world, so I will use the nations of the former Soviet Union to take the good news everywhere. Hmm. And the rest is the ongoing history of Pastor Sunday at Elijah. Wow. And we will pick up there with some of the principles that made this all happen. Hmm. Thank you, John. Interesting. I, I love hearing other people's testimonies. Uh, uh, everyone's testimony is unique. It's their own. You can't take it away from them. Um, and we can always glean something from it. Hmm. And uh, what well, John said a little earlier, too, it's uh, if we're not being persecuted, the question is, why? <laughs> well, maybe we're not in a position in the 
where we are now as Christians, depending on where you live, where the open hostility has got to that point. But uh, I do believe God uses persecution to his gain. So we don't know what our future is. All we can do is get closer to God in prayer and in study and uh, hunker down and depend on him and the Holy Spirit mm-hmm. <laughs> and get ready to um, fight the fine fight of the faith. That's all we can do. Meanwhile, I was really encouraged to hear that story there, how God would use a man from such humble beginnings and raise him. And it was just amazing. He just, he just happened to be someone that speaks Russian and did the, the, the uh, journalism. I mean, that is, that's not coincidences, folks. <laughs> and this is not something he learned overnight. It took him six years to get to that point. Mm-hmm. And so in those six years, he was faithfully doing what he was supposed to, and then God is using that to his benefit today well john thank you for that uh we look forward to next week the uh number 101 next week will be uh of course the subheading is kingdom driven church it's called priority and uh i guess it's a good question for all of us what is your priorities in life what should they be i think john will tell us (laughs) no Pastor Sunday. Pastor Sunday will, yeah. Okay. Thank you so much. Have a good evening. Good night. All right.